everybody. I think we're finally good to go. So I want to thank you all for your patience uh, and thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Uh, my name is Juan Marcano and I have the honor and pleasure of representing Ward 4 on the Aurora City Council. I hope you all have a wonderful new year uh, and are ready uh, for the challenges um, and opportunities that this year is going to present for all of us. So we have a really packed agenda today. So. I want to try to catch us up a little bit, but just so you know, I'm happy to stay a little after um, if y'all are, uh, just to ensure that everyone gets their questions and concerns. There's rec centers all over the city, except for on the west side of the city. And I heard a rumor, and I really hope it's true, that they are looking, they're, they're going to make Utah into a rec center. Is that true? So? It is on our capital improvement plan. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen anytime soon, especially Before not. I die? <laughs> <laughs> if I have my way, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, so I'll tell you, uh, that's been on the capital improvement plan for some time. Um, however, the current conversation on council, y'all might be privy to, you know, some of my colleagues think that blowing a $6 million hole in our budget is a responsible thing to do as if we have six million dollars a year less in revenue for the city that puts all of that deferred capital which is almost a billion dollars by the way all of this whole plan that the city has for parks rec centers other improvements all of that stuff just gets pushed further out into the future so what i can say is if we're able to keep that revenue from going away um which it's set to trigger in 2025 and I guess the goal is that between now and then they'll find some way to either trim $6 million out of the budget or that will grow into it without a plan. Um, maybe it will remain in the, same, in the current timeline, which is within the, within the next decade. But if we don't, I can't tell you where that's gonna land. Um, what I can say is that we also have other revenue sources that, you know, um, for example, that with the sale of the Denver Broncos, we have $3.8 million that the city of Aurora has received. Um, that has to be used for sports and you know some kind of programming like that, um, which I think a rec center would qualify for. Um, the city is going to open up feedback soon um, from the community to ask all of you, how do we want to spend that money? That would be a really great way to bridge what I believe the estimate I got back from staff was around $20 million. Normally a rec center is a lot more than that, but we already have an auditorium at Utah. Um, so that's the pool. Um, so the gap is smaller, but that 3.8 million would go a long way. Then if we can keep the 6 million that they're trying to cut, that would also go a long way. And then there's other um, funding streams that we can dedicate there, especially as we're paying down debts, because our rec centers are basically funded more or less out of the marijuana revenue currently. And that's why we were able to do the central and south so quickly is because we aggressively pay down that debt and then we repurpose it and do another. But if we have less revenue, you know, then you have less revenue to supplement the marijuana fund. The marijuana fund doesn't pay for all of it by any stretch. So hopefully I answered your question there. But yes, that's coming. Need all of you all to be very loud and let my colleagues know that we can that we should repeal the ordinance that they just passed. And by the way, they didn't even let us debate it last time. No, no. They just called for the question immediately and just voted on it. Yep. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, if you all let council know that you're watching them, you want a rec center, not a $6 million reduction in revenue, that would, I think, go a long way as well. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Ellen. Part of that also, sorry, is that Parks and Rec is the lowest paying. They only get a million dollars, and they only get so much. It less, it's like 30000 for programming in the library. Yeah. And they are the lowest paid employees mm -hmm. in the city. And despite what somebody said at council, oh. that they are not, $45,000 $45, a year is, does not pay for housing, does not pay for whatever. And they, but some of them are on second jobs. Yep. So that is another consideration that is being dismissed and they have not had a raise in like seven years. Yeah. So to, to afford a one bedroom apartment in Arapahoe County, 
And by afford, I mean you're not paying more than 30% of your income, right? Because we all understand 30% is like the HUD definition for what's affordable. You need to earn, what is it, 20 Five dollars and like fifty some odd cents an hour right now. Seventy six thousand yeah. a year. Yeah. So we're way behind on, on our pros um, and our pro salaries, and that's part of the reason why we haven't been able to find lifeguards and other you know staff to fully staff up our um, recreation centers. So yep. don't. Oh, and I, I think that you. Okay. Sorry, Missy. So I. This kind of relates to housing and. Uh, yeah, so uh, my rent went up again, uh, 20%. Went up last year, 20%. It's going up again in March, 20% this year. And I actually live in low-income housing. And so that's uh, it's going to come out to be $1,200 a month for one bedroom. Right over there, Florida Station Apartments. Uh, I'm guessing they've given you 40% worth of improvements over this time period too, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, so... See, yeah, so the cost of living is going through the roof. Wages are, are going up, like not enough, but. Heavily outpaced by inflation. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and then we have an immigration issue. The border is a catastrophe. And I know that just recently, Polis shipped, I don't know, what was it, 100 immigrants to Washington, D.C. Obviously, the now. Texas governor did it too, and the Florida governor. So, like, obviously, we're having issues with immigration. And so, with immigration issues, I don't know what's going on in Aurora. Are we accepting a lot of these immigrants that are coming over the border in Aurora? They're showing or, Okay, so, so basically we a, don't really know what to do. This is a nationwide issue. Yeah. And we're not, you know, I've asked staff, our Office of Emergency Management is aware they're meeting with other emergency managers throughout the Denver Metro. Because uh, you all read in the newspaper, right, that like you know, there was a whole bunch of folks that showed up in Denver. Yeah. And they mobilized to try to house them. We're having similar things happen all over the Denver Metro. Some folks are coming down the Colfax Corridor and ending up here. Um, I was actually at a meeting earlier this week on Tuesday um, with Mateo Salvarez and a bunch of other folks uh, who organize and you know have uh, like the Day Labor Center, the Fields Foundation, all those folks. We were uh, in a room with like 30 different organizations. Uh, Councilman Medina and I were there um, trying to figure out what we can do to prepare because they're pretty darn sure that we're gonna get an influx, whether it's Republican governors uh, along the border, just you know, playing politics with people's lives and basically human trafficking them to make a statement, or some of these nonprofit organizations that are basically overburdened and don't know what else to do, but to send people where they're asking them to send them, um, we're going to end up in a situation like this before long. So we were trying to figure out where can we, you know, temporarily house those folks. I actually reached out to Director Kiki as well to see if maybe some of these schools that have been, you know, or are in the process of being shut down could be converted into like a temporary, you know, shelter, right? They have kitchens, gymnasiums, restrooms, et cetera. Um, and if there's something we can do as a region to work together, pool resources to help these folks get their documentation right, and then, you know, connect them to either other organizations in the Denver Metro if they want to stay here, or help them maybe find places, like there's communities, I know elected officials and uh, community members out on like the East Coast, for example, where they have a lower cost of living. They're smaller towns on the East Coast, but they have large Latino communities, right? And resources there the way they might be able to integrate folks. So it, it's an emergency though. And ultimately this is because the federal government has completely failed over, the, over my entire lifetime basically on immigration issues and continues to use people as a scapegoat. People es escaping horrible conditions. Like, I mean, could, what would it take for any of us to walk or drive or run a thousand, two thousand, five thousand miles away from our homes? How horrible must be the conditions that you're leaving, right? And then the people get here and then we just play politics with their lives. So it's absolutely shameful, but um, probably said more than you wanted to know, but we, it's something that we have been discussing. So the other thing is, is that we already have a shortage of housing and it's become unaffordable. Completely. And obviously I don't think anyone has any answers, but what's your answer? So I mean, have you been in talks? Have you been in talk? Have you been in talks with uh, developers about? Because yeah, I mean, I like I went. I've been canvassing, and I talked to this one guy who's from Afghanistan. The only way I could like talk to him was through Google Translator. Both of his kids didn't speak the language, and he's he was basically like, hey, "You better be prepared to do physical work for the rest of your life because what else are you supposed? To, I can't even get a job. I you know I don't. I'm applying for." Jobs that pay twenty-one dollars an hour, and I, I have a college degree. So, yeah. where you know you have these immigrants pouring in here, and it's like, what are they going to do for the rest of their lives coming here? Yeah. I mean, is their life really going to be all that better being here than if they were back 
in Central or yes, South America. Absolutely. But if they're living paycheck to paycheck, how is that any different? It's than a very different struggle when someone's threatening your life on a daily basis because you won't pimp yourself out or because you won't engage in basically unpaid labor or they're threatening your family because you won't go work the coca fields or whatever the case may be. It's a very different situation here when we're struggling. We have our own struggles, right? Um, but I'm not going to pit their struggle against ours and be like, well, you know, ours are more important or something like that. This country was founded by, well, Settler can only the colonialism, but we'd like to say we're a nation of immigrants, we welcome people. So let's live up to that, right? The new Colossus poem that's on the Statue of Liberty, let's actually do that. Um, my solution for our area here, because it's something that will help, obviously, folks who are escaping, you know, really horrible situations in the countries they're coming from, but also help the people who already live here, is to invest aggressively in housing. Um, I, and I have been talking to folks about that. I actually have met, with, and we're setting up another meeting with uh, the Rural Housing Authority, uh, CHAFA is the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, um, and uh, Paul Williams, who is with the Center for Public Enterprise, on how can the public sector basically supplement what the private sector is either unwilling or unable to do, which is to actually build housing that is mixed income and attainable for folks on you know all rungs of the economic ladder. Um, they've had some great success actually out east, um, you know, doing some of this. So I want us to see if we can do that here. We have some great tools that the state legislature have given us like a revolving loan fund for affordable housing that we could tap into, we're gonna to need to require, uh, you know, contribute some resources from the city as well though, um, to make this happen. Because um, I, I don't see the market chomping at the bit to build, you know, housing that people at 80% of the median income can afford. Yeah, so basically we don't really have any answers to how, I mean like, is there any like, like big tech in California, Silicon Valley, like thinking about, thinking of solutions or innovations as to how we can use our great minds that we have in Silicon Valley or wherever to like innovate and like yeah. are there ideas where the like the private sector and the public sector can come together to create there, housing that you there's know. willingness I've actually talked to some developers as well um, there's definitely willingness to build or to have them contribute basically to address our housing crunch um, but it's not that simple unfortunately and you're gonna need the political will to really drive policy that reprioritizes our budget to focus more on housing. Because we were talking about how little pros get, our housing and community services department gets like 3% of the budget of that. So yeah, I mean, that's actually part of your budget, isn't it? Yeah, so who so, knows? So yeah, um, it, it's just, you know, what are our priorities? If we really care about housing, um, if we really wanna, you know, do pro, uh, equitable economic development to ensure that everyone who works here, or who lives here can earn an, a decent living, right? That's not reflected in our budget, it's not reflected in our council, quite frankly. Um, so, yeah, that's where I would start. Ellen? More housing authority project down in my neighborhood. But when they opened in 2019, they raised it to $1,400 for a one bedroom. I do not know how much it is today. And there have been issues, and there have been promises, and it was lip service and corruption and dog and pony by Aurora Housing. They have a long history of corruption. And we need to change who sits on that commission and we need to change the direction of Aurora Housing because they are for a for-profit model. Because your predecessor, who I have, you know, I spoke to her about rural housing, and they, yeah, she said they have not done one freaking thing until it changed over to more GOP-ish. And they took it and they ran, and they have lied to us, they have lied to people, they, yeah. It's not a good situation for our housing. I, I'm gonna need some evidence of that, but if we can see that like they're raising rents to basically market rate, um, yeah, that's something that we'll absolutely jump on. Well, I mean, yeah, they said when they, they dog and ponied it, it will start at 900. Yeah. When they opened, it was 1,400. Yeah, and they wanted to put a 300 unit high rise, and we said no, and now they want a second part of it, and Aurora Fire said no, because we want that kept as an open space. Basically, they had made promises of <coughs> that there would be adequate parking and that there would be no street parking. For three years, they have parked on the street. 
and they had, yeah, it was a whole dog and pony, and it was a whole lip service thing, and they are not accountable for what they've done. So. All right, like I said, if you can show me something that corroborates that, I'm happy to jump on that one. I'm Carlton. Uh, this has been a great meeting. Uh, I, a lot of things were said. There was some frustration in what we said. Uh, I, I see a lot of you in other meetings. And uh, we live in a democracy. And I meant my favorite statement is democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest. And to me, that means that we take on the world when we meet. We, Adolf Putin, as I call him, he wouldn't have a meeting like this. And there are countries, those people in South America, uh, they don't have this opportunity. Uh, we have 350 million people in this country. Tonight, we had 29 people here. That's a start. <laughs> but my vision, it, it sort of gave me a vision that we need to be have people more be more active in a democracy. Uh, there's a saying, democracy doesn't work unless we do. And I, I'm encouraged by people that show up here, and I hope we can get more people here uh, at school boards, uh, because our democracy is in peril right now. You know, so is the world, you know, with global warming. Uh, and we better get our act together. Uh, you know, I've, I've been reading about the Mayans. That civilization disappeared off the face of the earth. This, uh, this nation could also disappear off the, you know, in you know, 200 years from now, what are they gonna say about the Americans? Will we still be there? Going in the same direction as opposed to being at odds. So with that said, Mr. I'm Sonny. going to say three things, and just three things, because everyone has been so patient with everything. We've had such wonderful information that has been given, and um, I am so glad that I was able to come today. So I am Leslie Summy, brand newly minted um, commissioner for Arapahoe County District 4. We were sworn in on Tuesday. Thank you very, very much. I am so grateful for friends and supporters who are here. Um, and what I can tell you is that everybody said, once you get sworn in, it's like a fire hose. And so just go with it. And, and yes, it's a fire hose. So since Tuesday, what we have done, we had our first county commissioners meeting. And um, that meeting was, um, oh, I, I lied. We were sworn in on Monday. <laughs> Sorry, because I know that Dolan's going to, you know, put this out there, so we can't say anything's not true. So we were sworn in on Monday. First official uh, county commissioners meeting was on Tuesday. County commissioners meetings are, they happen on Tuesdays at 9.30 in the morning down on Prince Street at the Aurora Govern Government Building. And so uh, we're Arapahoe County Government Building. That's the second day in a row that I have said Aurora something. Is it, I mean, does it mean anything? I wonder what that means. We are a huge part of the county. <laughs> well, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. So we, we had our first meeting, and we elected a chair. Our chair is Commissioner Warren Gully, Carrie Warren Gully. Um, and our um, pro tem, our chair pro tem, is Commissioner Jeff Baker. And our financial officer is Commissioner Bill Holen. And um, so for those of you who do not know where Arapahoe County District 4 is, it is roughly... Uh, South Parker Road to Mississippi to Buckley to Bellevue. That may be changing. Um, the the uh, committee to make recommendations on redistricting uh, has um, already convened, and so that is in the works to redistrict and, uh, because we are growing, and so we need to, to change, and we've had the census and all that stuff, so we will be changing. I am um, hopeful that my, my uh, district um, that I know and love will not change too terribly much. So that is, that's a, a couple of things. We are working on um, our new, other new commissioner is Commissioner Jessica Campbell Swanson. Um, she is commissioner for District 2. 
And um, we have been meeting at um, the CCI building. CCI is Colorado Count, no, County Commissioners Incorporated. And um, that group uh, puts on a wonderful uh, orientation for brand new commissioners. We were there yesterday, we were there all day today, we will be there tomorrow, learning a, a lot. Um, today was focused a lot on um, land use, on roads and bridges, and um, also on public health, which leads me into, we do have our own Arapahoe County Health Department now, Arapahoe, Arapahoe County Public Health, is it public health or health, Arapahoe County? Yeah, Arapa Arapahoe County Health. So we are now no longer part of TRICARE. TRICARE is, does Tri not, County. or TRICARE. Tri County. It's late, I'm tired. <laughs> You're right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so Tri-County Health is no longer in existence. Arapahoe County has its own, and we stood that up on the 1st of January. The good news about it is that a lot of the employees from Tri-County Health um, have segued very easily into Arapahoe County Health. One of the, the good things about Arapahoe County uh, is that in our diversity, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a large part of, of um, building into the system so that every, every member of the community will be able to access the things that they need. Um, so uh, the other big thing is Tabor. We're gonna be talking about it a lot because uh, I, somebody had, had said it somewhere today. Um, in Arapahoe County, um, had we debruced as Douglas County has, um, Douglas County, um, our very uh, conservative neighbor, um, and had we debruced, um, removed that revenue cap of Tabor as 51 other counties of the 64 counties of Colorado, had we done that, Arapahoe County would have had for 2022, $53 million. $53 million that we could have used to move our communities forward. So that is something that is very important to me and that I really do want to work on to, uh, to get that changed. I mean, we're, we're a county that our residents deserve to, to have their potholes taken care of. Our, our residents deserve to, uh, to have a quality of life that where they're not as worried about things. Our children deserve to have their schools funded. And so we need to really look at, at um, uh, removing that revenue cap of Tabor. And with that, I'm going to give, uh, what, yes? Go ahead. Finish. No, I was gonna give the microphone back and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so you. Oh, there's a, uh, how right. much did we get as a citizen of that particular? Roughly, roughly, for most people, because if we're all pretty normal, for most people, your Tabor refund, yearly Tabor refund, is between 11 and $20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the 750 that we got this past year that we, it was really wonderful to get, that, that came from a different pot of money. Oh, so I also, that was a different. Oh, that's not the same. Exactly. <laughs> and I also want to add to that, we're gonna, next month, we're going to be talking about Aurora's long-term financial outlooks mm -hmm. and deep roosting in Aurora. Because yeah. y'all know we're deep roosted on sales tax, which means we're not revenue capped on sales tax, but we are not on property tax. Mm -hmm. And that is at least $3 million a year ongoing that we're not putting into our roads, that we're not putting into rec centers, that we're not putting into other services that you all count on. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, ma'am. So that was going to be my part of my statement was that Adams County did it years ago. Yeah. And we need to move, work on Aurora. Yeah, yep. we do. And here we and here we are. We've got Aurora and Arapahoe County. <laughs> yes, sir. So you mentioned land use. I know um, council member Mahoney reach out to everybody um, that is uh, I have seen emails come across the screen um, I have had whisperings in my ear um, of things that we are going to be talking about and working on and um, for our residents and absolutely the Aurora Reservoir is one of them and um, uh, 
I, I, I can't say too much because now my words are all in my head like, yeah, I remember somebody said that thing about fracking and what things we're doing. And so no, we don't, do, but yes, tell everybody because we need to, uh, we know, you know, numbers, the, the, the more people that are talking about what they want, the more the government knows how to act. And so we need to get people at every, um, at every study session, at every community meeting, every stakeholder something, um, to say, hey, this is something I'm interested in. I know that we're talking about it. This is what I would like to see happen. So I don't have much to say other than you continue to get to be involved. And um, yes, talk to your county commissioner, absolutely to Commissioner Campbell Swanson, absolutely. And, um, and absolutely to me, because you are my constituent. Right. The reason why school systems exist. Anyone at all? Yes, sir. To educate, but also when the parents go to work, the kids have to be taken care of. So it's kind of education and babysitting. Education this, and yeah. babysitting, I love it. <laughs> One more person. Yeah. I brought candy for as a prize, but unfortunately as a teacher, none of you get the candy because you are not quite right. <laughs> so, school system exists for one reason and one only, and that is to improve student outcome. That's it. Improve student outcome. Question number two. I know you guys are gonna get that one. Why do board, um, why do board uh, school boards exist? Yes, David. To oversee the teachers and the system as a whole, to make sure that they're performing at the performing at the level that they expect to be performing at. Another one. Yes, Madam <coughs> Commissioner. Uh, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. One more person. <laughs> Love it. Well, school board exists to represent the values and vision of the community. Not to hire and fire the superintendent. That's our job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the school principal did not know this. <laughs> So, myself <laughs> and Carter over there, my colleague, and everybody else that's on the diet every Tuesday, every other Tuesday in the month, um, that's what we do. We come to make sure that the values and the vision that you have given us when electing us is still upheld. How do we do that? We hire a superintendent and we give them the keys to the school district and we say, you take care of the operations. And we are going to look at how governance and policy works. So, that said, what is the governance policy or the governance model of Aurora Public Schools? The model that we have adopted is the student outcome focus governance model. Who knew that? <laughs> Put your hand down, Carter. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that? <laughs> Not to fight about curriculum, <coughs> though that's important. Not to fight about which color the teacher, which skin color the teacher should be. Not to um, argue over what color the carpet in the classroom should look like or if we should use a white board versus a green board, but to make sure that every single student succeed. Student outcome. And that's what APS has adopted. And it's been adopted since 2015. So it's fairly recent. We're still navigating that path. As such, there are two, two special types of policies 
and those are results and limitations. So Aurora Public Schools, and here it is. Thank you. So, the results and limitations. So if we can go to the first slide. There. So, the results, what are those? They represent your vision, you the community. And the limitation represent your values. We'll go deeper into that. Next slide. So, the results and limitations the results are um, goals related to the student outcome uh, governance. And the limitation describe how the school system should behave um, as we seek to bring that uh, student outcome focus uh, to fruition. Okay, next. By the way, I just wanted to point out that your visions and your values that we have already collected and put together, this, which is our priority, is what is going to guide the full superintendent search that we, we have embarked on. I wanted you to know that. So Aurora Public Schools has um, four results. The first one, Devin, do you want to read the first one for us? Do you want to read the first oh. one? <laughs> Early literacy, the percentage of third grade students in APS operated schools who demonstrate grade level literacy skills based on CMAS English language arts literacy assessment will increase from 19.7% in August 2022 to 28.2% in August 2025, an 8.5% increase. Let's Thank you. So the first result is early, improving early literacy. Since 2015, when we, we adopted this um, uh, governance model, we were trying to figure out what is it that we are going to really work on to bring that tangible, to make that tangible. And then COVID hit and it got paused because we had other things to work on. Then and Kiki, and Mike Carter got elected on the board. And in August, we said, we can't sit there without any goals. That doesn't make sense. If we don't have any goals, we can't hire or fire a superintendent because that's what we use to evaluate them. So let's have some tangible goals and then we will monitor that. We pushed and then we used the baseline as this horrible, horrible, horrible CMAS result. But that's okay. This is our baseline. Now we have something to monitor. And these are the numbers that you see. From 19.7% to, we're gonna increase it to 28.2%. Meaning the percentage of third grades would read by 2025, we're gonna make sure that at least, at least 28% of third graders read at grade level. I know what you're gonna say, and I know you guys, you guys are gonna bombard me with questions, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I do not agree with it. I, dispu I disputed that. I argued that. But because this is new and the system is not ready for it, we couldn't push for any more. However, the increase that we are going to make is 8.5%. That's something compared to years prior. Second result. Result number two is about high school graduation. And what does that say? Helen, can you read that for us? Please. Mike. There you go. I know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> Board result two, high school graduation, the percentage of APS students in APS operated schools graduating in four years okay, will increase from initial est estimate of 75.3% in 2022, available January 2023, mm -hmm. to 78% in 2025, available January 2026, based on the new Colorado graduation requirements, which requires a demonstration of college and career 
readiness approximately 2.7% increase. In plain English, thank you, Helen. In plain English, what we're trying to say here is we care about high school graduation. Who doesn't? My daughter is in high school now. I do care. We're saying that our high school graduation, because we did not have a baseline, again, remember, it was empty all the way till last year, August, okay? We demanded numbers, right, Connor? <laughs> we said we are going to use the results that we have had, um, which is 75.3%. That's the rate at which APS high schools have graduated. That's the rate that we graduate. We're going to use that as a baseline and bump it up to 78%. So by 2025, 78% of our high school, uh, of our 12th graders, we should have 78% of all of our 12th graders graduating with the requirement that the CD, CDE gives us, because we have to follow CDE requirements, which is college and career readiness, okay? That's result number two. Result number three. Come on. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Ain't working. It's January. It's the first meeting of the year. <laughs> All right. There we so, go. result number three. A volunteer to read. Uh, board result three. Equity percentage of the sixth grade Hispanic, slash Latinx, and Black students in APS operated schools who are on grade level level in English, language, arts, literacy, and math are measured by CMAS. Grade will increase from 13% in August 2022 to 20% in August 2025. So, what that means, and thank you, what that means is that our sixth graders, we want to make sure that our sixth graders, Latinx and Blacks, in APS, read at grade level. Yes, it is completely outrageous, but our Latinx kids and black kids read at even lower level and do math at even lower level than their white counterpart. If you ask me, this is a horrible comparison, but that's the way it's been done in our school systems. So I'll come with you, I'll come to you with a question, with your question in a minute. So what we want to see is that we bring the black and brown students to read and do math at 20% um, by August of 2025. That's an increase of 7%. Helen, your question. Okay, so the Asian community is left out. Where's Absolutely, because they're doing outstanding. No. Yes, no. they okay. Absolutely. So we'll revisit that, Helen. Uh, result number four. And that's the last result. Equity still. We want to make sure that um, still Latinx and black students uh, in high school that are taking the PSAT, their reading, their PSAT level goes up from 15% um, to 22% as far as the PSAT result is. That is an increase of 6.2%. 6 so this is what the board is monitoring every other Tuesday. We sit there and we say, what are the, where are the data? And we query the superintendent and it looks boring because there are all these data that are projected and people don't understand what we are talking about because we've never told you what exactly is it that we're looking at. So from now on, when you look at the, when you're watching the board and we're saying we are doing a progress monitoring, you know we are talking about our result. And when we say this month, 
um, we are monitoring high school graduation. <coughs> At least you know that it's result number two. <coughs> and if we say we are looking at, we are, we are uh, monitoring um, uh, equity, at least now you know that it's PSAT results and it is sixth graders for Latinx and Blacks. So now you can follow up. What about talking about um, our limitations? Can we go back to results for a minute? Uh huh. We're still in results. I know, but you were going to move on. I'm dumbfounded by these results because we are starting. I'm. Why are we starting so low? I can't understand that. My tax has been paying for public education for over 60 years. I hate to age myself. I see. And I can tell you, in my high school graduation, with a very diverse team, 100% of the children graduated. In the graduation class before me, 90, there was one child who did not graduate. So I'll call it 99%, although it was probably 99.5%. I am glad to say I did not enroll my nieces in, in Aurora Public Schools now. Instead, they moved off to New York to ride New York. These are despicable. They're disgraceful. Why are we in this position where these students go back to board result one? Help me to understand why we're waiting till, was it? Mm -hmm. 2025. 20, yeah, but what, look at these levels. Yeah. We're not even at 50%. We're not even at 30%. Yes. This is despicable. I How agree with you. I agree with you. Before I ran, I, Dr. Ann Kiki, there wasn't even any result to call it despicable. So it was even more despicable because there was, a, there was nothing at all to stand on to say APS is doing great or APS is doing terrible. Now we know after, after the pandemic, we know that APS is doing terrible. Oh, by the way, it's not just APS, it's every single school district in Colorado. Oh, I know. But I am talking about APS, so yes, let's focus on APS. These numbers here were requested to be put on so that everybody knows, so that everybody argues, so that everybody sees what is going on, and then you keep not just your board members accountable, but, what but about also, the excuse me, ma'am, not just your board members accountable, but every single teacher. What about parents? And the parents, too. What about and parents? the parents too, You're because we are all life. in this together. We are all in this together. Yes, but at 20, at less than 30%, and go to the high school graduation, what was it, 70? 78%, correct. Okay, what are these children doing who aren't graduating? What are they doing when As they aren't graduating? Officers. Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones dealing with them now. Correct. So and why are you going problem. with your question? Mm -hmm. So my, I'm trying to figure out so where you're going with, with your question. Where in the school public system uh -huh. are we planning on getting to, let's call it, above 90% graduation rate? That's where is that? Is that 2050, 2075? Because that's unacceptable. This is a great question. So I am only one voice out of seven. So when it was decided, and I said this was too low, we were told we can't shake up the system. My colleague is here, and I am telling, I'm speaking. So mm -hmm. if you were to follow this and come to the board every other month and say, you guys need to do something, or I'm going to get pissed off, we will do something. But when nobody cares, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when nobody cares, Nobody the watch, watches the school board meetings to find out what is going on, to be informed, and then we bring that up to you, and now you're outraged. I'm not saying it's a little too late. I want to say now is the time to I, care. I, I'm outraged because it's my community. Me too. I'm, I'm outraged 
My children are in their 40s. Me too. My, my children are all educated. I'm worried about the society that we have out there today. Me too. What is going to happen to these children? That's Where why I ran. Their parents? Are their parents expected to be at these school board meetings to see these numbers? Are they expected to teach their children at home to a certain level? It should be 70% on the parents, 30% on the school system. I agree. I That's agree how it was you. raised in my home. I agree with you. So there, what, what, how do we straighten that out? You know, where I come from, there are three parties that are accountable in the school system. The parents, the students, and the educators. Where you come from? I am from a country called Ivory Coast, West Africa. And when, when a student is not doing well, we don't cast blame on the educators alone. Both parents, students, and educators come together and figure out why the student is not doing well. Why the school is not doing well. Why the system is this way. Without blaming, casting blame on one party or the other. Here, what I have noticed is that we find a scapegoat and we beat the scapegoat even when the scapegoat is dead. Mm -hmm. So how do we change that? And that is a great question. And that is actually why I have been inviting school board members here and you will continue to see school board members yes. here. Because Ann and I have had a lot of conversations around not just the performance of our schools, but what contributes to that. And the reality is a lot of what people try to hold our teachers and our school board responsible for actually falls on city council because we're the ones that set economic policy. We're the ones that deal with housing issues, food insecurity, things of that nature. That falls on us. So when you have kids who don't know where they're going to be sleeping tomorrow, don't know where their next meal is coming from, going to school and underperforming, that's not their fault. That's our fault. For letting that happen and it's also the parents fault mm -hmm. i'm yes. tired of them. Thinking that absolutely it, it's so this is part of bringing all this together and you know i also want to be respectful of everybody's time because we do have a very full agenda but we're gonna you're gonna be seeing a lot more school board members here because we need to be working together with both of our school districts aurora public schools and cherry creek with the city of aurora so that we can get our economic policy right we can get our economic development policy right we can get our housing policy right and we can get our educational policy right is if we're not talking together, if not, rather, if we're not talking to each other, if we're not working together with parents in our community, with our elders in our community, we're gonna keep having more and more issues and these guys already have their plates full. Because when we fail our youth, they see it first. They're the ones that deal with it. And that's not acceptable. My last statement is going to be, shouldn't the school system be first in resolving so, so, there, so, so if the school system's numbers were higher, children were more educated, it would help our police department, it would help uh, the education and being able to get a better job and moving on and being able maybe to save money and not have food insecurities. It all starts with education. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And I'm dumbfounded by yes. that. Yes. Yeah. This, this is, is the reason why I know these numbers don't look good. Yeah. I am not proud of these numbers either. But these numbers had to be there to everyone's shame so that we monitor and try to improve. As we look at these numbers every month, it reminds us about our responsibility. And then we keep everyone in the system accountable. That's what we do. That's the reason why we monitor every month. We look at the data. You can say the data are flawed. You can say the data are fake. You can, say, you can say whatever you want, but at least we look at the data. Yes, there. So, so first of all, Colorado ranks 49th in the country in <laughs> funding for education. And if you look at all the top states, top funded states like Connecticut and Massachusetts, uh, they're the highest performing states. So if you want your school system to improve, you can repeal Tabor and then increase taxes that way.
I'm not saying that money always is the answer to everything, but that could be a start and also smaller classrooms. So I just, what I was going to ask is, uh, so what steps can we make aside from money to improve these scores? But also, why do you think that uh, Hispanic and black scores are lower? Is it mostly because of economic situation at home or? OK. Yeah. OK. You answered your question. OK data collection and part of it is data collection well, what's that data collection mm -hmm. so that's why they're not performing as well part of it okay can you elaborate on that when you say she'll tell you yes tell you. okay i'm going off of what he just said um i know some teachers they have their master's degrees 15 years of teaching their family is on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. yep. They qualify for free and reduced lunch. Yep. And if you don't think that that's a sad state, I don't know what. I am a retired school teacher. Um, I had, I came, I taught at Cherry Creek. I had wealthy parents. I told them what they could do to help their children at home. They told me that's not their job. It's my job. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I am a teacher, by the way. I sit in a classroom. So Maybe. I know what I am talking about. I teach high school. And the first K-12 that I, I taught at is this ground here. I taught in this school right here. Now I'm in, I'm in a different district, but no I know what I am talking about. So um, I see the different numbers there. Um, is there any numbers, anything dealing with people, kids that are special needs or handicapped? Um, because my brother, he did go to Aurora Central and he did have an incident that occurred to him with a PAR person um, during that time frame that he was there. But is there any, you know, they have challenges, but they ha they're very smart too. So it just, if there's a stepping stone of where they are now to where you guys want them to be, is there, a result or a numbers that you guys are including in this to share to the public? That's a very, very thoughtful question. Um, at the time that this was put together, by the way, uh, the overarching results and, and limitation is something that we, the new board, have inherited. We only fought to put the goals within, okay? So when that was crafted, the prior board had said that they've gone to the community. <coughs> this is your vision and your value. <coughs> so I guess at the time, I know the community did not think of, did, the community did not think of that aspect. But still, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that they're completely forgotten. Right. It's still monitored, but in the back end. And it shouldn't be. So again, because when we don't hear from the community, we assume that all is fine. When we hear from the community, we also are able to act. Right. Love that. I do have my card here, and you can always reach out to me, and I will give you that information. Um, Yes, my love. Um, can you go to board result three real quick? Uh huh. Thank you. So, as a student of the Cherry Creek <coughs> District, I find the land or brown. Uh, the what's the word? Well, like a lie, because I have I know so many brown people and black people who are in the top of their class. That's true. That's very true. But that could probably be in Cherry Creek. You said you belong to Cherry Creek District. Yeah. We are talking about APS, the rural public school. So it's fairly different, my love. No, don't, don't apologize. This is great. Thank you so much. This is a great observation. Love that. Thank you. And this is this kind of goes back to a point that Dolan asked, you know, well, why do we see this, especially in certain demographics? It's because of socioeconomic equality, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And you see that 
in this in uh, Creek, it tends to be a more affluent overall district. More money. And more money, absolutely. And also we have more ESL students in APS, so that requires more resources. So. And that's a big but I do want to say to you. And what's your name, love? I'm sorry? Umberto. Umberto. Okay, so I do want to let you know that that doesn't mean that um, browns and blacks are not smart. We do have some amazingly smart kids, and I know you're one of them. Right? So we do have that. But we want all of them, all of us, to be up here. Yeah. Dr. Kiki? Over you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, how did the board determine what the the results would be? We're going to jump to what is it to twenty percent? How did you determine where you were going to jump to? Right. So um, the way the process that we use this time is look at the the. The last CMAS numbers and and then decide okay this is where the CMAS numbers are and this is where the PSAT and the SAT numbers are we're gonna use these numbers as the baseline so the beginning and then we concerted among all seven of us with the help also of the superintendent and his team and we said okay let's throw numbers on the on the board and then, and then we went that way. Okay, if we go this high, what's gonna happen to the system? If we go this low, what's gonna happen to the system? So the leadership team um, did their math, they did their magic out there with the numbers that we threw, and then they came and they presented to us, and then um, the board voted. Okay. And could you define CMAS? CMAS is Colorado, Colorado, I <laughs> 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 a measure of academic success. There. <laughs> Colorado measure of academic success. That's a measurement of academic success. Colton. Um, thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Kiki. I've got a question, um, yeah. burning question, because I've lived in this. Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Chance Foriucci, the Executive Director for the Havana Business Improvement District, mostly known as on Havana Street. It goes from 6th Avenue to Dartmouth. Uh, it's about 4.3 miles in Aurora, Arapahoe County. I see some new faces here tonight, so thank you so much for joining us. We have a pretty packed agenda, so I'm going to keep it pretty brief. Um, we will be bringing back lots of events um, to the district this year, including the Havana Street Global Market, and by request to the community, as well as the businesses along Havana, they want a night market. They said that's where our communities really enjoy those global markets, so we're gonna try three of them in June, July, and August. We are partnering with Bonfire Event Co, um, and then also with other property owners. And then we also hired and contracted some videographers and influencers, so we're gonna be going and trying to tell more of the story of small businesses along Havana. Last year, our real goal was really trying to connect our stakeholders and businesses with um, local leadership and city council and the mayor, and I think we did quite a few of those outreaches, and we wanna continue moving that forward, so we do have an upcoming um, networking event in the community is welcome to attend as well. I just really request that you RSVP because we're always so limited um, in some of the spaces when we host these events. It's January 25th, it's 3 to 5 p.m. and it's gonna be at Marisco El Rey Dos, so you can go on our website at onhavanastreet.com and RSVP. If you have any specific questions regarding the district, we have a long list of new businesses opening, actually, so because we have such a tight agenda, you can come visit me afterwards or um, I can always do an update at a later meeting. But thank you for your time, and uh, thank you for your support of On Havana. You know, the Mayans uh, weren't good about their, uh, the way they treated their environment, even though they were Native Americans. So uh, I hope to see all of you again at other meetings, and let's get together and, and make this. Yeah, everybody is going to have a solution to what's going on, and we, we need to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Carlton. All right, y'all, and with that, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. We're going to be